my privilege this afternoon to introduce someone who's been a friend of the Trailer Terrace Association for many, many years and has actually spoken at our conference for the last several years. And with that, I will turn it over to the Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, Chad Smith. Thank you very much, Chad. I want to be very informal and at the end of my talk, I'd like to ask you to ask questions. And uh, I would like to first introduce the first lady of the Cherokee Nation, Bobby Hill. Mm -hmm. I have to admit to you, Shane, being the last year because Bobby didn't come with me and she didn't really come and say, of course, Bobby, she's the one who will be other sit around and talk to all the stories and stuff. So, she could come this year. So, I want to keep the book published in Georgia, the history of Georgia, basically Gwinnett County, Georgia. And they were talking about the trail tears in Cherokee. And the author was saying it was a supreme effrontery for the Cherokee Nation to develop a constitution and call itself a country among the nation of people within the borders of Georgia in 1827 when it passed on this constitution. The supreme and fundamental. So when you think about that, is tribal nationhood really nationhood or not? And it's a question we have to face today. Do we want the Cherokee Nation to be a nation? A social service agency, a geological <coughs> organization, a anthropological model. And so when we go back and look at the trail of years, it becomes a, a great focus for analysis and for lessons of history. And we always understand that history repeats itself. And so if we go back to the trail of years, you can look at it geographically. And we we'll had the opportunity two years ago to see the trail tears very geographically on a bicycle trail trip. I and about 14 other people, five in low level trip, got on bicycles in the new church of Georgia and took the northern route of the trail of tears to the town of Baltimore. And so you got to see the terrain, you got to see the geography. It was no longer an academic exercise. From a very clear perspective, where our ancestors did 180 years ago. But what it really did for me is create more questions. We knew the map, we knew the routes, we got the planet, we got the map, we got uh, science. Maps. But not only that it happened, why did it happen? Why did it happen? So he started evaluating the trail years. Because of economic pressures, you can take the National Geographic's uh, historical atlas and see all sorts of interesting trends and data. Um, in our history class, and Kathy Mohan's here, we use those slides to show how Western expansion really was first occasioned by frontiersmen and all the top operations, and then they were followed by the plantation system. They've actually got the maps of some lands, plantation systems. Probably the most poignant is a map of black slave concentration in the 1800s to the 1860s. And each dot on this map represented 200 black slaves. The really what it was is an index of economic and political power. You can see Western expansion. Um, those economic systems by those businesses. We can also see the evaluate the trail of tears in the political. We go back in time and between the United States as a federal government and the various states, very adamant about states' rights, you can see the Cherokee Nation playing out between the states' rights and federalism. Politics were not about the chair of the Politics were about something different. And we were some of the general pawns in that chess play for the states of the central government as the United States was emerging. Then we look at the trail of 
appears in the background of Luke. And we see it in 1830. The very hostile jump from the laws passed by Georgia to force the Cherokee people out of their home country. And really there, it was a question about the supreme of Georgia being, quote, destined to be permanently an Indian reservation for these barbaric people, as the author of 1912 recanted. We saw that. So we look at 1829, 1830, it was very hostile. And uh, a fellow at the University of Georgia graduate there, you may remember that in Georgia until 1980, Indians were deemed incompetent witnesses in the courts of Georgia pursuant to 1829 law. So when I graduated in 1973, technically I could not go to the Georgia courts and testify. Follow-up to those very hostile laws was the Indian Removal Act in 1830. It's really fascinating because it gave the president the authority to exchange lands in the southeast for those now the Indian territory of Oklahoma. And of course, what it was was a, a cover to affect Indian removal advanced by the Georgia governors, the southeast United States governors, and Andrew Jackson. When we were on the bicycle, Two years ago. Uh, one of our interns was with us. I said, Would you go back and look at the vote on the Indian Removal Act? If you recall, history is really fascinating. So, what we need to understand, if we didn't understand it before, with the Arabian records and such, there, there was no black and white in it. There were friendly settlers, there were non friendly settlers. The hostile Cherokees were privileged. We were plantation owners and we were hunters. The economy and politics were, sent, were sometimes a bit uh, amorphous and changing. But what we found in Congress with the Indian Removal Act is that it passed by a vote of 102 to 97 only after Andrew Jackson lobbied through his party to change the vote. And I say that because we began to create perspective as we were riding in North Georgia, doing 60 miles a day. And they were in North Georgia, if some of you are familiar with that area. What struck me was that all the construction was relatively new. Really nice new big houses, sort of estate uh, houses. And I didn't see anything 60, 70, 100 years old in all that room. And so we asked staff also to go back and look uh, at the, the land population which would 1840 and 1930 six northern Georgia counties hardly any hardly increased in population at all. What dawned on me the Georgians did not need the land in the eighteen thirties. They just wanted it. And once they got it, nobody moved in because if it didn't have water and gold on it, Lots of folks just didn't make their claim. Ultimately, like the north of uh, western North Carolina, eastern Tennessee, timber companies came in, bought it up, clear cut it, had no economic value, came back to the United States as some charitable gift, which I'm sure they got taxed, and now we have the uh, Smoky Mountain National Park. <coughs> Evidence of what was occurring in 1830. We had it. They were, they got it. Only by a vote of 102 to 97. You had three more men who been tempted. They may have not been in the two years. Then in 1835, still on that northern route of the bicycle trip, we asked our staff, would you go look at the vote for the Treaty of the Woman ratification of the U.S. Senate? Passed by one vote. After I think Senator Ford from Tennessee reneged on his commitment to John Ross, who voted for the Treaty of Minnesota project on his face. So legally, the trial period is a great story because the backstory of political intrigue and betrayal found its way into the statutes of 
congressional interpretations, the U.S. Supreme Court decisions. So we keep thinking about really what is the Cherokee Nation. Back then, they were sort of good and neat and nifty to have an Indian nation and Indian Republic. But they had one. 23 treaties of Great Britain and the United States. But was it something that should continue? Really, should the Cherokee Nation be that novel? We're a class of people, according to the U.S. Census in 2000, 750,000 paid Indian ancestry. So is that really what the Cherokee Nation is best to be in Chile? The Indian Ancestry Club. Well, we keep asking those questions through our history. And as we dig deep into history, it really becomes fascinating. Because the characters and the policies and the people that keep changing, it's not like the forward and back, to and fro, again and against, in favor of particular issues, is probably best captured by a great historic romantic character, David Crockett. You know, the big Indian Crockett. You have big Bowie knives, you know, killing Indians, Cherokees in particular. He didn't quite like it. But what did he do in the 18th century to show you how you couldn't tell he was a congressman from Tennessee. Did you know he separated his party, separated with Andy Jackson, and voted against the Indian removal because he knew the consequences. He knew it was in violation of all treaties. It was, in, it was contrary to the integrity of the United States. It was against his conscience. He said if he voted against the Indian Removal Act, the Indian Removal Act would be his political suicide. Next election, he was soundly beat and then he joined Sam Houston. Um, just as a footnote, he was in our first aid program and then all ended up in Texas. <laughs> so, in that period of time, there's great lessons for us to learn because today we're still asking so much questions. And the people that we have to deal with really sometimes are faced not black and white, a bit of voice keeps changing. So we have to be able to ascertain through certain principles what we want to really use our freedoms in the world. Because we keep having to answer questions today like, why do Indians want their own government? You know, that's just shocking to some people that the Indians want their own government. It becomes even more distressing when they realize they want to have the same status as the United States. Why can't all of us just be Americans and live all? We all have the same common stuff. You check your language, it's okay, but don't you have greater social needs? Don't you have greater things to worry about than some abstract language? Why don't you rejoice when we honor you with our mascots? <laughs> and even today, when we're fully integrated with the general public, the question is, why do you want your own public government? Why do you want to be a nation? And uh, I'd like to read you something. And our Secretary of State, Melanie Knight, sent this out to our highest political governmental um, celebration, September 6th, the Cherokee National Holiday. And she wrote to all of her employees and passed it on. We'll just read it to you in this entire Osceola God, today is the day, September 6th, 1809, the day we celebrate is the new constitution the nation recognized after we moved to a current establishment of talent was our new capital. As we know, the celebration isn't about a constitution alone because the nation's first constitution was in 1827. The celebration is about a very divided nation coming together to make the solemn pledge of political unification as a single shared nation, the same nation that we serve today. 
The issues are no longer removal, seeding of lands or allotment. The issues are nation building, gaining, making and trusting our territory and others. These contemporary issues can also pull the nation apart if we allow them. While the issues are different, the legacy handed to us is the same. Preserving a nation united to future generations of Cherokees. For we all have ideas, opinions, and viewpoints that contribute to our nation. We cannot forget the sacrifice and leadership of our ancestors in the promise of 1839 to move forward together no matter how much external forces attempt to pull us apart. It makes me incredibly proud to be a Cherokee citizen, proud of our leaders of the millennium, their foresight, and statesmanship. Let's do our part to contribute to that rich legacy. Then she goes down and recites part of the Act of Union of 1839. Whereas our fathers existed as a separate and distinct nation in the possession and exercise of the essential and appropriate attributes of sovereignty from a period extending into antiquity beyond the records of memory of man. And whereas these attributes with the rights and franchises which they involve remain still in full force and effect. It's due also to national and social relations of the charity people to each other and to the body politics. We have a nation today because our ancestors were state of faith, steadfast, <coughs> maintaining that nation. So we have to ask the question today about all the disguise and the smoke and the mirrors and the goodwills and the bad intentions which we don't know and when they come from different quarters. Because all these people profess that it's your friend. They did that in North Georgia in 1827. Said, you don't need gold, we need it at the Capitol building to cover the Georgia Dome. They said, we don't, you don't need oil, the Indians don't need oil. Uh, Nellie Johnstown, the first commercial well in now Oklahoma. You don't need your lands or your national existence, you need to be like us, whether you will or not. And today, you don't need gaming because it's a sin that corrupts the city's souls of all. So we have to ask the questions, it's very poignant questions and look for those very powerful answers. Do we want to build and invest in a nation? Or do we want it to be merely a social service agency? Do we want to have a long-range hundred-year plan? Or do we want to do what's politically expedient? Do we want to honor our ancestry? Or do we want to be trained? Do we want to provide for our children, or do we want to self-serve ourselves? And basically, the reason that I'm so proud of you is that this organization helps us maintain and develop the analysis and determine the answers to how the Cherokee Nation can survive in the next hundred years. It's not only mapping the geography out, Crab Farm, Mad Walk, which understanding with absolute crystal clarity why the trail would be returned. And even with more precision, what how do we know when it happens again? Of course we're not going to be sent to Mexico or to California. And it's not a geographically delayed protracted it's a political retraction. It's a political retreat. The rights are eroded today. So how can we understand this great lesson to the tribal leaders? The backstory, the economics, the politics, the law. And we have the intelligence, the finesse, and resolve. The next time we'll be prepared. The Trail of Tears serves as a baseline to help us understand to each of you, if your tribal members or not, if your citizens of the Cherokee are not, have the affinity to preserve the Cherokee Nation for the next hundred years. So I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I 
applaud your work. And now it's my standard convention to ask three questions and we're off the door and looking at you. Question number one. Well, you're thinking I want to acknowledge our trail tears, riders, riders, and Todd, would you stand? They're going to have a presentation later today. <laughs> this is the second group. I had the opportunity to actually go last year. It's actually a group 25 years ago. This the first time. So, question. Chief, I didn't know until this holiday of the Free Press Act. The newspaper, the newspaper has been used as a political tool for years. And I wonder how you feel. I know you're instrumental in getting that passed. Is that going? hurt your political chances and how do you reflect on it? Um, we passed the first try to do something like this, a free press act in 1999. And uh, uh, we came out of a constitutional crisis. We had a president chief decide which laws of the Cherokee Nation he would enforce. <coughs> so the first year the first few months, we buy policy, uh, separated through our newspaper, and we had a long tradition with our newspaper, speaks, and uh, gave the instructions and the policy to the editor to print the news, whether it be good, bad, or other. I never wanted to see the newspaper until it hit the stands. And the reason you do that is have a third party look over the public official show to make sure there's full transparency. Sure, people have all the information. The council uh, memorialized that policy and those principles in the law the following year. We drafted the, the legislation and provides that our, we have an editorial board that establishes editorial policy. We have a newspaper editor that's tenure. I can't fire him. He can only be impeached by the council by the public officials. And they have some. Charters of what to do. Publish the work, be fair, be balanced, and be uh, thorough. And so, what it has done is there's going to be a fire alarm to go off. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you see smoke coming from all corners, disregard. <laughs> years, Julia, I, and Kevin, and Elkhorn, in our dark ages, 
because the United States tried to keep us from operating this government. In that abyss, in the dark age, there was a consortium of Cherokees, all Cherokees, by blood, by citizenship, who tried to find some way to use the mechanism of government to help our people. In fact, my grandmother was one of the founders of the United States Field Bank. It was a consortium of Cherokees who got together. Congress let them organize under the 1936 uh, Oklahoma Indian, Indian Welfare Act so they could access a $10 million rotating economic development fund in 1946. It wouldn't be fun for about 12 years. In fact, they got a chart in 1950. By 1962, the Bureau of Interference had to force them to have an election. Well, what they've evolved into is a dissident occasioned by Ross Square, our principal chief in 1975. This may be more than you want to know, but you have to tell us. <laughs> he ran, the Cherokee elections are always an enemy, I can say it that way. They're never poor. And so in 75, when Ross Square lost, when he won, a guy named Borden went over to UKB after losing his race with the principal chief. And we finalized the UKB in 92 and as a distant political organization, it's been at odds since that time. So that's basically what it is. It's a, it's a subset of Cherokees that the BI recognizes. And in essence, there's a distant split of political group in Cherokees. Is that clear? Makes it more funny. <laughs> yes. Okay, the question is, what do we do to address the issue of groups that claim to be Cherokee Nation? And uh, I want to make it very, very clear that we never discourage somebody from claiming Cherokee ancestors and learning about their heritage, their history, our language, and such. And we get very adamant when the groups coalesce and say they want to be Cherokee Nations. Because they're not. They're not Cherokee governments. Uh, so we have a campaign to educate students. In fact, we had a campaign in Tennessee just recently because Tennessee was going to recognize, and I'm trying to be diplomatic, but the most diplomatic word I can think of is beauty. Six beauty groups in the Cherokee Nation. And I don't mean to kill them, but it's just, when you look at it, you see what they do, it's just beauty. And so we had, we are um, they've had to do a lawsuit with the state through their internal mechanisms did not recognize these six groups. But we have videos, we have websites, we have information trying to, to educate the general public. And again, it's about nation. It's something not to be taken up. It's not it's not anybody else's to claim. The nation of the church nation. Very valuable. And if there's anybody who, if there's a choir that preaches message to it's you. Because you've seen <coughs> along the entire trail of tears, the graves paid for that nation. If somebody comes to come and claim that, <coughs> is the front. Thank you. Do you have a question? Well, my, my concern has to do with the Dawes role and the requirement that to be a member of the Cherokee Nation you have to be descended from somebody on the Dawes roll and how you can um, say you're representing the Cherokee people if that's the only people that can be part of the Cherokee Nation. And when I got here I saw something about uh, Ross being the first principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. The, the first time they had a single chief that was in charge of the whole, you know, that represented all the people was, what, did, what form of government did they have before that? Well, the Cherokee Nation as early as 1790 was evolved before a single government. Before there was a consortium of towns, traditional governments. 
1847 of the Constitution. The real issue is not the DAS Commission. The DAS Commission is a mechanism to make an objective uh, decision as, as to who chose in 1898 or so who were going to be citizens of the Cherokee Nation. It was not. Because we did not acquire American citizenship until 1901. We were citizens of the Cherokee Nation. Just as a matter of fact, uh, have you ever heard of Will Rogers? Did you know he was not born an American citizen? He didn't have American citizenship. He only got American citizenship with the rest of us in 1901 by special statute. He, like the other citizens, had dual citizenship. So the issue is the Cherokee Nation, as again, is a government. There's thousands and thousands of folks in the country. Many are here. They have Cherokee ancestors, but they cannot be citizens of the Cherokee Nation because of a decision their ancestors made. In 1898, you chose to be a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, or you chose to decision to the heirs. In 1898, the requirement was you had to have some charity blood, which is not, was not the big deal, and you had to resign the charity nation. So if you went to Kansas because of the American Civil War, you didn't want to come home, you chose to expatriate from the charity nation. If you went to California for the gold rush in 1850, you didn't come back and chose, not you, but they chose to expatriate. If you walked for the South and went set up a residency outside of Texas and didn't come back or wherever, for whatever reason. It was a political decision made by ancestors. And that decision is part of the common decisions. The Dawes Commission role is the bright light role. So the evidence those who made that decision. Which is not to say Everybody in Cherokee ancestry can be part of the Cherokee community. And I think that's what we're going to see here. Is people who are citizens and non-citizens being part of the community to advance the interests of the Cherokee community and the Cherokee people. Hi, Mark. That is the first time somebody's told me that hardball question. I got that response. So, <laughs> it is a difficult question because uh, it, it, it's just something very hard to accept that an ancestor's decision binds us following generations. So, any other questions? Well, thank you very much. I know Todd and Lo and the Bike Rider has a presentation coming soon. I'm looking forward to that. So, thank you so much. Okay.